welcome. It's, uh, it's so great to see so many um, faces here, uh, gathered here on a Tuesday evening, uh, familiar and um, unfamiliar faces. It's nice to see you all here. I'm going to introduce uh, uh, my protagonist in just a moment, but this is a, um, a series of talks and interviews and chats that have been organised by the Ethnic Diversity Programme, so big thanks to Vicky and Roxanne and the team who've laid it on. Um, I hope what you'll hear in the next 30-40 um, minutes is a fairly frank conversation um, about uh, careers um, and journeys through organisations and race uh, and ethnicity and diversity and discrimination and all sorts of things. Um, it's going to be a cracking conversation um, because of the person next to me. Uh, um, sharing the stage with me is Sharon White. Sharon, uh, many of you will know from having been a, a senior civil servant in these parts, Sharon is um, uh, one of the outstanding public servants and civil servants of her generation. Uh, she and I were permanent secretaries uh, very briefly together in the glory days when the um, Wednesday morning colleagues wasn't entirely white as it now is now. Um, uh, Sharon was second permanent secretary at the Treasury. Before that, she was DG for public spending. She's had a really extraordinary career across various branches of government. She's worked in the British Embassy in Washington. She's worked in the Ministry of Justice. Uh, she's worked her way up through the system to be second permanent sec. And it was a, it was a kind of great personal and professional sadness when we lost her, but she didn't go outside the public service. She now heads up Ofcom. Uh, and she's making waves there. She um, took on board the regulation of the BBC the other day, just almost without batting an eyelid. So she's one of our very most accomplished uh, leaders uh, and, and role models. And it's, um, it's a great delight to have you with us this evening, Sharon. Welcome. I sort of feel it's all downhill from there. <laughs> um, so uh, the rules of the game are we're going to talk for 30, 40 minutes, uh, uh, and then we'd like to open it up to questions. So if you've got questions for Sharon, or indeed for me, but um, uh, questions for Sharon, just, just um, come forward uh, as soon as we finish this bit of the conversation. Uh, we are, you'll notice, uh, recording it and videoing it, so this will, the conversation will be available um, for viewing remotely afterwards. And we'd encourage you to talk about it and tweet about it. This is an open session talking frankly about an issue that really matters. So, Sharon, I'm going to start by asking you some questions in a kind of interview style. Um, your career was pretty stellar from an early stage. I think you, you um, went to school in London but made your way into Cambridge University and you ra rapidly had a stellar career that took you throughout the uh, branches of the civil service that I've mentioned. Um, were you aware as you progressed um, that you were breaking down barriers? And in particular, were you aware that you were breaking down race barriers or were you just getting on with your career? How did it, how did it feel? Gosh, can I just, first of all, just which is lovely to see you. Can I just say, because I've been out of the civil service for four years, and um, so there are some friends I recognise in the audience, but also particular thanks to people um, that I don't know who've come on a cold, wet um, Monday. I mean, the question about career, I mean, I always find when sort of people, Richard, sort of list out, lists out all the jobs I've done, sort of slightly embarrassed, because I always think there were sort of very sensible civil servants who, um, sort of concentrated and focused on one area and became really specialist. And I'm the other extreme in that I've done lots of jobs and worked in most departments and have been a bit of a sort of butterfly. Um, I mean, I guess Richard's question, you know, did I realise that I was sort of breaking down barriers? I think, um, I mean, maybe just a bit about my background, those of you who don't know, my parents came to um, to the UK from Jamaica as part of the Wind Rush, wind rush Generation. Um, my mother, in particular, had come from a really religious background and basically as soon as she could leave Jamaica, she left at the age of 19 and my dad, whom she met here, um, um, came in the, in the early 60s. Neither of them uh, completed their education. So my mum um, went to primary school, very small amounts, basically left primary school properly at the age of 11 um, because she was the eldest of nine and basically every time her mother popped another baby, she had to stay home to look after, um, to look after her next sibling. And my dad sort of made it to school until he was about 14 or so. And so although my parents weren't kind of really, um, in a very overt way, very focused on education, you definitely, I definitely had a sense growing up that, um, you know, that, my, that I was having opportunities that my parents didn't have just by dint of the fact that I was able to go to school. Um, just the fact that I was able to complete school at the age of 18. And the sort of, did I realise I was breaking down marriages? I guess I went to an all-girls school that was, that was a state school in East London, but was really good at creating opportunities and creating aspirations that the girls didn't have for themselves. So in my year, there were three or four of us who went to Cambridge, and I was never 
you know, I was never one of those kind of really focused, ambitious people who had a five-year or ten-year career plan. I never really quite knew what I wanted to do next. And, you know, when I was younger, I always thought I would be going off to sub-Saharan Africa and saving the world and working in a refugee camp and so on. And when I left, I did economics at Cambridge, and when I left, most of my friends were doing management consultancy and accountancy, and I thought, God, that sounds really boring. And so I always thought being in the public sector and working on public policy would be, would be really interesting. And then my path that I've taken since then has felt a bit like a series of sort of, not quite random moves, but there's never, for me, there's never been a grand plan behind, behind each job. So um, something you've said to me in the past is that you you don't like the BME label. You don't like no. you don't like ethnic labels of that sort. Just just say a bit. Wh 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 why not? What's your what's your thinking? Um, so when I when I joined the civil service in 1989, um, and when I joined the treasury, there were more uh, there were more people who looked like me cleaning the loos than there were doing certainly as economists, but doing any kind of mainstream civil service jobs. And I've always ha hated the term BME, BAME. I've always hated these terms that sort of lump together um, different communities, different ethnicities whose life chances are radically different from each other. So if you're a, um, you know, if you're a Bangladeshi woman living in New Newham without, um, without English as your first language, your life chances and the life chances of your children um, are so much less uh, positive than if your family, you're the third generation of university educated um, kids whose family were from East Asia. And I find the term and the lump, um, I find it almost discriminatory because it sort of lumps together sort of colour and ethnicity and geographic background into one sort of lump of other and one lump of not white, and I think the issues and the, so say, the life chances and the possibilities of progression are so different um, within different different groups, and that's why I, you know, every time I've had responsibility <laughs> for diversity, I basically go through all the documents and delete BAME and put in people from different different ethnic backgrounds. But in all, in all your years in the civil service, did you? I mean, you, you know, you hear many stories about people encountering just kind of lazy, slightly passive, hidden assumptions, kind of implicit racism, you know, you're not entitled to be here, are you sure you're supposed to be in this meeting? That, that, did, did you, were you conscious of that sort of unconscious bias or? Oops. Um, so I've, I mean, I'm sure like lots of people in the room, I have had both lots of unconscious bias and I've also had quite overt discrimination. Um, the unconscious bias, which I've always found quite entertaining when you, you know, you walk into the room and you know the coffee cups suddenly start to migrate towards you because you're clearly the only person in the room who can pour the coffee. So for years I refused to pour the coffee. You know, I mean, for literally for 25 years I refused to pour the coffee for anybody. Um, I spent two years working. I don't know if anybody's from the Foreign Office. I spent two years working in the embassy in Washington in the mid 90s, and it's the first time. Uh, and this was amongst colleagues that I heard actually really quite racist language and racist uh, sort of just very stereotyped views about, you know, you lang I mean, I don't want to repeat it. Um, I mean, that's a long time ago, mm. um, but I think all of us are sort of used to walking into rooms and meetings, even, you know, even for me, even now heading off com, which is quite a sort of public role, and for people who don't know me, you know, I can see their eyes changing as they realise I'm the person who's chairing the room or chairing the meeting or giving the speech rather than the person who's carrying the bag for the person who's doing those things. So I think it's just it's something one internalises. And you're, um, you're a role model right now, is that, is that something you're kind of conscious of? Is it something you wear with pride or just take in your stride? Do people tell you that you're a model, role model? Um, I guess, particularly since I left the civil service, because I think as a civil servant, you're, you know, the, the lovely thing about it is that you're, it's more of a 
back, I always feel it as a back room, more of a back room job because your job is basically there to serve the government and you're there advising ministers. I definitely feel since I've moved from Whitehall and all of this to Ofcom where you know, I'm the chief executive and the decisions we take, the decisions I take, I'm personally accountable for. That has definitely given me, I think very positively, more of a platform. And I think I'm also more conscious of how few people there are like me, not just in the public sector, but just more generally across in the UK. And so although I don't necessarily see as myself as some sort of, you know, you know, as you can tell, you know, role model, I never wear a suit and all this kind of stuff. I definitely feel I have a responsibility to really support people who are coming behind me. And I also feel um, it's really important that I'm good at my job because if I'm not, I feel that the way in which not just people from ethnic minority backgrounds, but women who fail in jobs which are very public, I think the treatment can just be much, much tougher than, than if you're a, you know, from the, from the mainstream community. Um, I want to come back to the gender thing in a moment and, and uh, the um, intersectionality, to use a phrase, but um, just broaden it out to, to your views on diversity as a senior leader of a big public sector organisation. Um, if you were asked to explain the case for diversity, would you start with the business end or the moral end or somewhere in the middle? So I always get quite irritated by the business case, and it's not because I don't believe there is one, but I feel um, unbelievably strongly that the reason why we um, need to be not just more diverse and more inclusive is because we live in a country where we are serving customers and the public, and the civil service has got to look like the, it's got to look like the country at large. And that's because it matters in and of its own self. Not necessarily because even if the civil service was going to be as effective with a homogenous culture, it matters as a matter of principle that we're able to, to look like, have the views of the different perspectives of the entire country. And the same applies actually to my own organisation, Ofcom, which has been, uh, frankly, even less progressive actually than the civil service in terms of diversity. And we're now running really hard to catch up. We had a, only a single woman on our exec board for 15 years, for all the time that Ofcom had been in existence. And now we've got a team that's 50-50 and we've got more ethnic diversity at the top, but there's more to do. And we do that because it's the right thing to do, regardless of whether they regardless of whether the business case stacks up or not. And how, you, you, how do you get that across to, let's say, a, a perfectly well-meaning professional, brilliant at their job, uh, senior manager who says, yeah, I hear that and I'm prepared to sign up to it and make a speech about it, but actually it's not my problem right at the moment and it's not a thing I'm going to focus on. I'm going to focus on three things and none of them happen to be race and lo and behold, race just doesn't get a look in. How, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you persuade that person that it's not just a nice set of words, that it's good for us, but it's something they need to take really seriously. Have you? I mean, I think all of us, if you live in the UK, you know, that person has, will have friends from a broader perspective, will have daughters, a mother, you know, you, we live in a society. I mean, I think about my own organisation where, you know, the vast majority of our engineers are men, the vast majority of our economists are men. And they have got really excited about the prospect, particularly of more gender diversity, but more ethnic diversity, because they can also see where actually taking the business case, possibly more than the um, moral case, they can see where the market's moving. Mm -hmm. You know, they can see that actually most of the consumers of, of our products, the technology or our regulation, uh, are, are brown and white and all shades between and of different genders and different sexualities and it's been fascinating some of the some of the people in my organization who I thought it would be the hardest sell to have been the people who've been most excited by the possibility of us becoming a more open and modern organization because they've seen it as we've brought apprentices and other another talent into the organization 
they can see that we are sparking ideas and perspectives that we didn't have before. Um, and so it's partly, it's also the proof is in the pudding because, I mean, you know this, Richard, you've been championing this for years before the civil service took this as a mainstream issue. You bring people in with different talent and it suddenly becomes electrifying. So, um, so in your role as, as Ofcom uh, Chief Exec, w w give us some kind of concrete things. What, are, what have you done to advance race equality? You mentioned apprenticeships. Yeah. Um, just say a bit more about what actually you do as Chief Executive yeah. to make this work. Um, so, so, so I have two areas of focus. So focus number one is my own organisation. And we are doing all the things you'd expect. So we, we had no diversity targets in the past. We've got diversity targets for gender and ethnicity and will increasingly, as we get more data, have so for disability and sexuality. We, have, um, we are looking right across the board, particularly where we are least, um, we've made least progress in parts of the organisation at different initiatives. So whether that's apprenticeships, which are starting to work really well in engineering, but also on the media side. We've got a great programme now for returners and we're, um, we're bringing in some amazingly talented, mostly women, um, who have been out of the workforce for a long time um, with children or other caring responsibilities. Because we're also responsible for ensuring that the whole of the media industry in the UK is also diverse, we are linking in with other organisations, so with the BBC, with Channel 4, people like Lenny Henry and Adrian Lester. So we are able to get into that virtual circle of what's working well for the media industry. And I have to say, the media industry has, has, got, a long, has got a long way to go, despite the fact that it really should be reflecting back UK society. So, Lots of initiatives, but also the key thing is that I've made it a priority for the organisation in a way in which it wasn't before. We now have a senior team that reflects the organisation that I want to see more broadly. We've got, we're starting to get people really excited about why it matters and how it's doable. And then we're working with a lot of media organisations whom we regulate. So a bit of a stick as well, in order to learn learn how we can do these things better together. So turning to your your, your old um, employer, the civil service, um, uh, and appreciate it's, it's kind of your experience is four years out of date. But wh where instinctively do you think we we should prioritise? What are, what are the areas you think that uh, we need to do better at, or where should we start? Well, not start, continue. <laughs> I mean, the good news is that certainly since I was last here. Um, uh, there has been progress made. I think, I think one really difficult area for us is around culture. And Richard and I spoke a bit about this um, before tonight. And certainly my experience of the civil service is that um, we're actually, we've actually done very well, I think, on gender because actually some of the cultural issues um, have been a bit less pronounced than with greater diversity of ethnicity. And to be, just to give the, sort of the, you know, the Treasury's example of this, so when I first joined the Treasury in the late 1980s, it was basically entirely male. And when I left in 2014, it was about 40%, 50% female. And what, what the Treasury was very good at was basically hiring all the sisters of the men that we used to hire. Mm. So everybody's <laughs> still gone to Balliol and all had a PPE degree and, uh, and in terms of ethnicity, you know, the 25% of graduates came from an ethnic minority background uh, and they were twice as likely to have gone to a private school and equally as likely to have gone to Oxbridge. And so I think there is a real issue about, well, as I say, culturally embracing diversity, genuine diversity, so not just visible diversity. And I said to Richard slightly half, Hardly. In a way, I'm very easy to hire because, you know, I've been to Cambridge. I, my education now looks very similar um, to lots of other people in the civil service. And I think really to make a start, not to make a start, uh, really to accelerate diversity uh, in terms of ethnicity, I think there has got to be a much greater embracing of different, genuinely different styles and different perspectives 
and more embracing of class diversity as well. Um, I do think very practical, and there's a lot of debate about sponsorship rather than mentoring. Um, for me, sponsorship was absolutely critical, um, both at school, but also then in my civil service career with somebody called Suma Chakrabarti, who I don't know, the, the, some people may remember, who was um, one of the few um, permanent secretaries of an ethnic minority background. His family have come from Mumbai. Um, and I met him when I worked at number 10 in the late 90s. And he was just brilliant at, um, what's the words, of advocating for me in the room, but also creating opportunities for me, particularly when I had children. So, you know, he created a, you know, a part-time DG job at the Ministry of Justice that I could do for four days a week and was always the person that was looking out for me really very practically. And I think sponsorship, not just mentoring, not just you know, those six monthly chats to see how you are, but having somebody who sees as one of their prime jobs, ensuring that you're permanent secretary in 10 years' time, ensuring that half the people in this room are making it to director, DG, and permanent secretary level, because why not? And I think that takes a very particular, I mean, Richard, you know, is great in this mold, but that takes a very particular talent and energy, particularly when you, you know, you're, when you fall down as well as when you rise up. Mm. But I think sponsorship, culture, sponsorship um, are really important. Um, can I, thank you, uh, can I just turn to the gender thing? So um, I had a fascinating chat with a a uh, woman who works in uh, part of my department works in the prison service, um, and uh, she's run, done a PhD about the experience of black women in the prison service. And she says, too often, that, or very often, that the discourse in an organisation like the prison service about race is actually quite patriarchal, and she feels invisible mm. as a black woman. Do, do, do you ever feel the kind of double jeopardy of, of gender and race, or, or, or do, you, do you separate the two things, or do you find them related? I mean, it's interesting. When I was in the civil service, I, this is entirely personal, that I felt I had an easier time as a black woman as compared to had, if I'd been a black uh, man, actually. I felt that, in a sense, I was, you know, some of the conversations were, because in a sense, you already see there's sort of been the sort of slightly subordinate position. And so, you know, you were surprising on the upside. I think in my current job, where uh, almost every chief executive I, I face off to is male. I definitely feel my colour and my gender together in a more pronounced way than I had in the civil service. So that's, an, as I say, just as an entirely personal observation and the fact that, you know, if ever there's a sort of profile about me in the media, it is always not... Um, you know, they've hired an economist, it's, oh my goodness, they've hired a black person, by the way, she, she has breasts and has kids, and isn't that, isn't that, mar isn't that marvellous? Um, and so you, you, it's just, it's been interesting to see myself defined much more in terms of both my gender and my race in a way in which, um, in the civil service, I hadn't, I hadn't felt that intersectionality in quite the same way. Quite the same way. Interesting. Um, uh, I'm going to open up to the um, room in a moment, but just, just, just a proxy for advising a group of people. Supposing you were in front of a group of bright, ambitious, not terribly posh, not terribly, you know, grandly educated, but eager um, young people, say in their early 20s who are thinking of a career, um, what are the considerations that would nudge you towards encouraging them to the public service and w which the elements where you'd say try? Try banking. Don't try banking. Or uh, another, oh another, se another sector. Oh my God, no. Um, God, no. Um, I mean, the amazing thing about the public sector is it's just so interesting. And, you know, I'm very lucky in my current job because I still, you know, I still face Whitehall and the government and Parliament, but also I've had the great opportunity to get to know um, quite a lot of FTSE 100 companies. And they're fantastic, but nothing is as interesting and difficult as a, or as important as designing a prison service that works for everyone or making sure that universal credit uh, delivers or ensuring that Brexit works 
um, you know, works in the way that returns this country to social cohesion. And so I think if I was talking to, uh, you know, a black woman out of university thinking about what she's doing, I would definitely recommend the civil service. I would also say, though, that, and I, guess, I, think I would say this very positively, the, the transferability of skills from the civil service into the commercial sector is really strong, but it's really poorly understood by the commercial sector. So, I mean, I knew nothing about business. I knew nothing really about any of the sectors that I regulated, but I knew how to deal with ambiguity. I knew how to deal with some very big egos. I knew how to deal with complexity. I knew how to deal with lots of very difficult stakeholders. And I knew how to, to communicate complex ideas in a very simple way. And you don't realize how unusual and how valuable a skill set that is. So I guess I would also say to the 25 year old, you know, don't worry about doing this for 10 or 15 years because actually the skills that you build up and the resilience you build up, I think is fantastically transferable if you want to do something, something else that pays the bills. And, and one, last, uh, one last question. Again, looking at the organisation for your now semi-detached status. Uh, so d does it look from where you sit does it look very white peaks, snowy peaks? I mean, we have got no, yes. is, is that notice? We've got no white permanent secretaries. We've got some very talented uh, um, black uh, DGs, but not many. So it's still quite, a, quite a, a, a white monastic institution. Is that how it looks from the outside? I'm not sure if it looks monastic. Monastic, I don't know where the word came from. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it feels, from, as I say, from a gender perspective, it feels uh, like we've made a lot of progress, and it also feels as it feels as though we've still got a lot long way, longer way to go in terms of I don't know whether I'd use the term snowy peaks, but um, you know, 40% of London comes from an ethnic minority background, and I'm not sure that if you look across Whitehall, we're you know we're some way from that. Sharon, thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm now going to invite you to ask questions. Uh, so any kind of comments or reflections on what you've heard or, or questions for Sharon from the room? Unintentional insults about, gosh, you've got a, jo I've got a job. I mean, I found, for me, it started to hit when I had kids. And I had, I mean, I'd been married for years and basically I'd, my biological clock didn't start to kind of thump until I was about 37, 38. So I had my kids relatively late. And the point at which I had so many comments of the, gosh, you've come back to work. Wow, well done. Are you part time? You know, I, I kind of thought I would just continue the job I was doing before. And I mean, this is where I was very lucky that I had Suma. I basically had, I think, 90% of the commentary I had when I came back was basically a, an expectation that my career was, was finished um, in, to the degree to, you know, finished plateauing as opposed to sort of finishing work completely. And then just noticing the difference in the conversations that my husband was having and I was having, I was really, I know it sounds like I was probably terribly naive, I was really shocked. Um, uh, I was really shocked, particularly by some colleagues who I'd worked with for years, that just for me, a sort of sense of, um, uh, I just found it very patronising. Um, your point about it's easier to bring people in and then you see the either the, the um, much lower promotion rates or much higher exit rates, and that's why I come back to culture. Um, and again, talk, taking my treasury example, so the quarter of graduates, private school, Oxbridge, uh, their rates of exit were still twice as high as their white counterparts. And I think that's when there is something about um, support and training and discussions and soft conversations and hard conversations amongst the whole community of colleagues about culture and language and um, you know, the classic things about, uh, you know, your lack of assertiveness in the meeting, which in the treasury is a big thing, very competitive, Haller and others are here, is a very, you know, if you're not wanting to be chancellor by day two of being in the building, you're basically about to be sacked. Um, 
and that fed through to lots of cultural stereotyping mm. of lots of colleagues. And so I just think there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a much more rounded conversation I think to have beyond visible diversity into actually what does it take to make a success of all the talents and that's language and ways of working and style and how we appraise colleagues and what we place value on. And that's got to happen before you recruit because actually the civil service gets known as being you know, a place where people from ethnic minorities come and don't stay for more than five minutes. You're better off recruiting, you're better off rec mm. not recruiting uh, colleagues in the first place. So culture sounds really soft, but I think there's really hard elements to it. For me, it's really important. Thanks for both those questions. And uh, yes, please. So when I came into Ofcom, um, I said, as, I mean, I looked across the organisation. I've been the gender champion within the civil service, so I was very lucky I'd had lots of support from colleagues here. Uh, and, I, and I made a commitment to the organisation that, uh, that this was the organisation that we should be aiming to be. We're all about the consumer. So if you go back to your business case, we're all about trying to ensure that consumers get the best possible service and we can't serve consumers if we are at that time 80 85 percent white and male and uh, and I basically created opportunities on the board so some people moved on um, we did some restructuring we hired some new people because of the BBC work and it was really important for me to show to the organization that um, it can be done and it can be done quickly and that it's really started to change the conversation in the organisation. So, but as I said, I had, lots, I had lots of experience to draw on from the civil service. Just a question for me on that. Um, question I sometimes ask of, of, of really compelling, inspirational CEOs. What, what happens after you go? Do you, do you think it's embedded or, or is it, can it drift backwards? Yeah. So I think that's a million dollar question. Um, it's interesting, we've, we have a change programme within the organisation which is very much focused on culture and values, um, uh, including around being a, a more modern values, behaviourally values driven organisation. And that's partly because it matters and it's partly because my, my, my hope is that that endures beyond me. And there are, there are definitely, we're trying to create a broader community within our, within, I guess, the equivalent of the sort of DG and, um, and SCS1 groups who see this as being really important. But I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, um, you know, I wouldn't overstate how successful we've been in that. Because you've seen even within the civil service that mm. a permanent secretary moves on and then suddenly, I think when Gus O'Donnell was, um, cabinet secretary, 50, there was a 50-50 ratio of permanent secretaries in um, you know, mainstream line departments and that went very quickly. Um, so I don't, um, I don't overstate my own effectiveness, but mm. the, the aim is to try to make this uh, sustainable. There's someone at the back, right at the back, yeah. I think it completely rings true. And I think from a personal perspective, I find it much easier to talk about gender than I do to talk about race. So we, what we're doing within Ofcom is we're trying to make this a little bit easier by um, hooking in with another organisation. So Channel 4, so say we, we regulate the media. So Channel 4 is really interesting because if you look at their um, makeup, they are the most diverse, the most ethnically diverse broadcaster, it's part of their mission, and yet they have a huge if issue with, uh, with race and a huge issue with um, uh, their colleagues from an ethnic minority background feeling that there is a class ceiling which affects race. And so our race network is trying to have a conversation with their race network in order to open up the conversation within Ofcom, if that makes sense. So to try to do that with another organisation going through kind of similar issues. Both, both organisations got a leadership who say they're committed, um, where there's not enough progress 
um, uh, and where there's a still a lot of, I mean, tension's probably too strong, but a lot of um, discomfort in having a conversation, a meaningful conversation about race, and for me, that translates into class. Mm. So that's, that's what we've tried. We've tried to take some of the, the, the difficulty out of it by joining in with another race network. Uh, it's a great question. I, 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 I think the importance of the race conversation is, is, um, is, is well demonstrated, um, and some departments have, have been great at it. Um, I, think, I think one of the reasons, I, I think I slightly paused over something you said earlier, um, one of the reasons people feel nervous is they think they might get the language wrong. So I think I'd be more forgiving on people using BME simply because I know it's a lazy catch-all, but uh, you know, it's a phrase that people use. Yeah, um, and I sometimes think that uh, one shouldn't be too worried about the language one uses because generally speaking, if you speak with goodwill, then, then uh, listeners will, will accept that. But um, uh, uh, I love some of the conversations you've been promoting. I saw one earlier, um, you, were on, you were talking about, um, it's on YouTube, you were talking about uh, race in the, in the radio industry, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting hearing from you on that. Um so I'm definitely hopeful. I think um, I think my main point is that these things there's not a sort of automaticity to them. Mm. So I think I think I think one has to work so hard to keep the momentum up and that's partly colleagues in the room today but that's also Rich's point which is hiring managers and permanent secretaries the Wednesday morning colleagues have got to feel that in their objectives is that their top table looks different in a year's time that if you don't have a DG two DGs somebody who's knocking on your door as part of your succession plan, who doesn't look like you and has got a different and refreshing perspective, that's a, that's a failure. And I think Gus was fantastic on this. I thought Jeremy, you know, great sadness over the last few months of Jeremy passing on. I thought Jeremy really got this and took some personally quite difficult decisions. I mean, it was a, you know, it was a, friend of mine but also a great supporter of mine um, and, I, and I think Mark coming in new but has also got the potential with his background I guess I feel that these sorts of events and the and the just relentless focus is what's going to take us is what's going to take us through if that makes sense I'm not pessimistic um, but I do realize how much work and effort has got to go into it and it's got to be from as much from the broader community as it is from people who come from an ethnic minority background. That, that, that sense of a continuing uphill is, is, um, is very tangible. So, the, you know, in recent history, the civil service has made momentum on this following the, you know, Stephen Lawrence killing them at first an inquiry, lots of momentum, lots of progress, and then frankly, it slipped, slipped backwards down the hill again for 10 years. Um, Right, we've got, let's, let's take a cluster. Okay, so your proudest career achievements. Um, <laughs> Uh, how do we achieve uh, inclusion in, in departments where the top team is not representative? And then your thoughts on intersectionality and uh, taking the easy option. Easy. Gold. Uh, I think the most proud, it's funny because I don't really think about, um, I don't know, successes or achievements, but I guess becoming, becoming a permanent secretary at the Treasury on kind of core Treasury business, so tax and public spending, I probably look back on now and think, gosh, that was quite a... Uh, that was quite a milestone. Um, the question about how do you how do you get inclusive decision making when there are relatively few senior people from an ethnic minority background? Um, I think it's I think the way to do it, and maybe this comes back actually positively to the role of the networks. 
I think one of the things that the, the Women's Network did, and we ha used to have a group that informally met across Whitehall, was to agitate and make it really hard for crucial recruitment and crucial decisions not to have an inclusive take. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is very practical. So at, at DFID, for example, you know, colleagues had to rerun competitions when the shortlist wasn't sufficiently broad and sufficiently inclusive. And I think there is probably something about how one harnesses the, 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 the kind of energy and the contribution in this room in a positive mm. way with permanent secretaries, mm. but actually to her, hold permanent secretaries and ex-co's really to account, in a sense, whatever the, the complexion and, and composition of, of, of those teams, there will be a key DG appointment coming up. There will be a key HR issue on pay and reward. There will be a key, I mean, each of us will be able to think of three key issues where you can kind of see an inclusive path and a less inclusive path. And I think the networks within departments, but harnessing the support across Whitehall, holds, holds in a positive way the key decision makers to account. So I would go to Richard and say, well, actually, Richard, it's fantastic what you're doing in Whitehall. Actually, there are t t maybe there are a couple of DG appointments to be made in the coming months. Um, you know, we'd love to be on the staff engagement panel to um, part of that process. Uh, if these appointments aren't going to be the inclusive appointments, then in a year's time, what's the path? What's the succession mm. plan? And mm. I think you can be pr actually really quite, um, really quite practical. Um, intersectionality, I mean, I can only agree that, again, my personal experience is that it's been much easier to talk about the easier, um, uh, the easier characteristic, easier to talk about being a woman than being black. Um, but, I'm, but I'm also proud of who I am and pr proud of the package, um, which is working class and uh, female and black and actually being prouder to talk about all aspects of that and that I'm a mother as well as as well as uh, as, a, as well as a chief executive and I think this is partly about sharing sharing stories and having the um, you know just being less uncomfortable with talking about all dimensions of um, of, of your person personality can I ask you a slightly personal question? You mentioned your parents are of the Windrush generation. Did you, what did you feel about the, I say it like it is, what did you, what did you feel about what was going on in the Home Office at the time of, and, and what it revealed about what had been going on before the Windrush story broke? Did, did you feel proud or angry or? Um, I mean, I just felt very, I felt my overwhelming feeling was sadness. My, um, my parents took British nationality in the late 1980s um, during a period of the, when Mrs. Thatcher, this is not part of political point, but when Mrs. Thatcher was prime minister and they felt that that was a particular moment of feeling unwelcome uh, in the UK and they were both really worried that, um, that being a Jamaican passport holder and Jamaican citizen would put, could put them at some point in, at a disadvantage. And there's a phrase amongst some communities about keeping a suitcase at the door, which is a sense that, you know, you never feel totally comfortable that um, your adopted country is the country that you're, has really accepted you. And my mother's, my, mother's, um, my mother's dead now. And when the Windrush story broke, I thought, my goodness, you were right to have you know, you were right to have got your um, status in the UK um, assured mm. because you were right that you never quite know what's going to, what's going to happen. Thank you. I don't, want to be, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be, um, I, don't, I, mean, I don't want to be pessimistic, but it was just, it really reminded me of the conversations I'd had with my parents. Let's take a couple more, right in the front. I agree. I mean, it's interesting because this is the same conversation we have as an organisation with 
the broadcasters, so with the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5 and Sky, all of whom are losing audiences to Netflix and Amazon Prime and uh, Hulu and so on. And what's fascinating, actually, Sky is, is very hot on this because although they don't show the data, they've, lo they've lost, they had been losing huge audience because they were losing people from an ethnic minority background who particularly couldn't see themselves in drama or comedy. Mm. And so the argument we're making to them is exactly that, that if you want young audiences, it's an absolute must have that there's greater diversity. And you can see this, you can see how Netflix, as I say, it's a, different, it's a different world from the armed services, but you can see the broadcasters who are doing this beautifully. Because to capture the youth, you've got, I don't know if any of you have watched Sex Education on Netflix. Slightly shocking, my 11-year-old watched it four times over <laughs> uh, two weekends ago. You know, you're filmed in Wales, and it's got breadth of um, sexuality, gender fluidity, race. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating because that's the market. And what we say to the BBC, especially, whose average age of BBC viewership is, I don't know if anybody can guess the average age of BBC One, 60. 60. Okay, and this is an organisation that expects all of us to pay a licence fee. So the argument when I'm not doing my, you should just do this because it matters, is actually you're going to, these, these media companies are going to, they are signing their own death warrant if they're not yeah. diverse. You don't see it on the screen, you don't want to watch it. And I think we're, we're sheltered occasionally by thinking that it doesn't really matter because what the, the, our, our model works for politicians. You don't have to, work, work, have to have, think too hard to imagine an incoming government of a different hue and of a different racial makeup where the current white peaks, I think, would just be mission critical, uh, unacceptable, but semi political point. Uh, right, two or three more. Yes. I mean, I guess the question is, how can you get them to tell their stories? And actually, if their story is also about um, coming into the civil service, doing well in the civil service, without feeling some of the burdens that maybe other colleagues in the room, I, that is a legitimate, I mean, that's a legitimate, very positive, it seems to me, story and actually a great way to outreach other colleagues coming to HMRC and I think it also relates to the privileged question behind you. I mean it's one of the com it's one of the complexities. I think about my own kids who are mixed race, who understand race and understand racism very theoretically because they read about it, but not because they've encountered it. And I think, you know, I their story is so different from the story of their mother growing up in the 1970s. But I also celebrate the fact that they are brown kids in London who think the world is their oyster, who's, who have no sense in which any of their opportunities are limited because the question doesn't even arise that they would be limiting themselves. I think if their story is of n no racism, no discrimination of success, isn't that great to be added to the piece? And that's an, for them, that's an authentic story. And it's a relative, you know, my experience is a relatively rare story, but isn't that, isn't that fantastic? Um, gosh, the question about authenticity and, um, I mean, I guess the message to myself is kind of, you need to chillax, because I think, you know, one can get so, um, sort of burdened by which element of your personality you're bringing to the office that day. You know, is this the person who's a, been a professional for 30 years? Is this the person who's a mother who's, you know, having traumas with her teenage sons? Is this the um, person who's now become middle class? Or is this the person who came from a working class background? And the fact is, all of those facets make me 
and I have become, um, I'll say I was never, you know, I was never that kind of very angsty kid, but I've become very comfortable in my own skin because, because everything that's made me has made me, has made my successes and has also made my, has also made my failures. And I think I've just given myself more permission, I guess, to talk about the full story rather than those slithers. And all of us have been to talks where you think, you come back and think, what's the story they, you know, what's the story they didn't tell? You know, I've been to all these women's talks where they've got nine children or 10 children, and it all works marvelously. And you think you've been lying, you've basically, you've lied for the last hour. Um, and I think you're, you've got a professional background, isn't that great? You went to Oxbridge, isn't that great? And when people meet you, they don't see that, they see a brown woman. And that's also fantastic too. And then you hit them with your smartness. And I think relaxing into the full you, which I just think it kind of takes time. Um, my less facetious answer to what I'm going to do next is, I genuinely don't know. So I'm kind of pretty clear that, that I won't come back to the civil service. Um, that's so good. Um, because there's something about having <laughs> been four years away from working very closely with politicians that I've got, I've got quite used to it. So I don't know, I've, I've, as I say, I've never been a planner. Um, my instinct is I might do something that's a bit more commercial, um, but then I love public policy because it matters and it's really complex. So I don't know, make me, make me, an, make me an offer and uh, I'll think about it. I won't take any of that as a no. Um, <laughs> I think, I think we need to close, if that's all right. So, um, first of all, thank you for coming, everyone. And thanks for those great questions. I think we could have kept talking for some time. But, um, Sharon, thank you for spending some time with us and for your openness and candor. You are, um, as we have all seen, you are not just a wonderful role model um, and a great public servant um, and a wonderful speaker and an all-around um, excellent and self-aware and brilliant person, all of whom comes together into the Sharon White that we see in front of you. So thank you, Sun Fuzz. Thank you very much. Thank you.